who have collected soil samples are the State of New Mexico Environment Department and the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center. CMERC, uh, the, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, um, continues to regularly post, as they have them on their website, their air monitoring data. They collected soil samples a long time ago. I've consistently asked them about when they're going to get the results back from the lab and publish them and have continually been told it's in process, it's in process, it's in process. They were most recently told me that they would uh, publish their initial soil sampling results last week. As of right now, when I'm on their website, they still have not been published, so I'm not sure what the problem is there. I mean, I know that they have sent their soil samples to their laboratory and et cetera, but so far those have not been released. The New Mexico Environment Department has collected soil samples. The last I heard from the Environment Department is they don't have sufficient funding to get all the lab samples tested at labs, and so they're holding on to the samples and we'll get them tested and we'll publish the results as they have money and as the results are available. So at this point, on air, we have CMERC and DOE data. On soil, we have only DOE data. Is there anything that we who wish to support transparency in this process and getting the facts and the information straight, is there anything you can suggest that we could do to support I appreciate the thought, and I support the concept as as much as can be done. I think the problem is basically with the Department of Energy still being too slow and still wanting to keep the lid on information as much as possible, and that's inappropriate, and anything that you and anybody else can do to raise that issue to DOE directly, to members of Congress, to the press, would be helpful. One thing that is historically true, as you know very well, is one of the important functions that you and other people do by raising public attention is the more public attention there is to something that gets more of a response. I communicate several times a day with folks at DOE and folks at these other agencies, etc., but other people communicating is helpful. And to suggest to them on a regular basis that in addition to whatever statements that DOE wants to make, what people would most like to see is the data. I have had DOE people say literally to me, well, we don't put out the data because nobody other than maybe you, Don, is interested in it. And I say to them, A, that's not true, and B, it's not up to the Department of Energy to decide what the public is interested in or not and what the public can understand or not. As a government agency, their responsibility is to put out the information, but they still don't have that yet. They put some information out more than they used to, but they still don't put it out as much or as fast as they should. And so the focus needs to be on them. And when other agencies like CMERC do get their data out, people should express their appreciation for them doing that kind of work because they get a certain amount of pushback from the Department of Energy uh, as well. That was Don Hancock, Director of Southwest Research and Information Center, and more than a watchdog, a bulldog, when it comes to the WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. We will continue to be in contact with Don in the coming weeks to learn more about what's happening at the WIP site. As for the calls and email he requested to help get the Department of Energy to release the data they have on the Valentine's Day radiation release, here's the contact information. Contact the aforementioned Brad Bugger, who is with the Department of Energy at WIP. His email is bradley, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y, dot bugger, just as it sounds, B-U-G-G-E-R, at C-B-F like Frank O dot D-O-E dot gov, or you can call him at 575-234-7500. 
We will, of course, post this information on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. I love being able to say that again. Now back to the news. We're going to stick with the U.S. and focus in on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The NRC has drawn up a list of 21 reactor sites in central and eastern U.S. that must carry out in-depth analyses of updated earthquake risks as a matter of priority. Yeah, think? The NRC has been reviewing updated earthquake hazard information submitted by the 60 reactor sites in the central and eastern region as part of its implementation of lessons learned from the 2011 Fukushima accident in Japan. Hmm. Three years later, and they're just getting around to this now. Some priority, guys. The NRC has now set two priority lists for the completion of follow-up work to carry out detailed risk analyses based on the reevaluations. The first list of ten sites, and by the way, the specific sites are not listed in this report, but the first list of ten has been given until June of 2017, meaning three, count them, three years from now, to submit their detailed risk analyses. While the second list of 11 sites has a deadline of December 2019, five and a half years from now. Oh, yeah, big priority. Let's hope there are no earthquakes between now and then. All 21 sites on the priority lists have also been given until the end of this year to complete an expedited approach review to ensure that the plant's systems and key components, particularly cooling systems, could ensure a safe shutdown if an earthquake were to occur at a higher seismic ground motion than allowed for in their original design. What? The NRC is still deciding whether a further 23 sites in the central and eastern regions, including TVA's unfinished Bellefonte site, will also require a detailed risk evaluation. NRC spokesmodel from the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, Eric Leeds, said, If a plant's new hazard exceeds the original design, the plant has to do a detailed analysis to determine any changes in accident risk from the quake. Dude, if there's a problem with the earthquake being bigger than the design specifications, the last thing we need are a different set of analyses statistics. That's rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. Similar reevaluations are being completed for three nuclear power plants in the more geologically complex western U.S., Palo Verde in Arizona, Columbia Generating Station in Washington, and Diablo Canyon in California. So while the NRC is dicking around trying to figure out the exact extent of the risk that we may be facing, on March 6th, the NRC reported that Unit 3 reactor at the Browns Ferry nuclear plant in North Alabama automatically scrammed due to low reactor water level as a result of a trip of both recirculating pumps. David Lockbaum, the Chattanooga-based director of the Union of Concerned Scientists Nuclear Safety Project, mused, Odd, the plant's safety studies explicitly state that this will not happen. Lockbaum, by the way, is a nuclear engineer who once worked at Browns Ferry and later at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as a nuclear safety instructor. Browns Ferry is the Tennessee Valley Authority's oldest nuclear plant, and on Tuesday morning, May 6th, the newest of three reactors at the plant, 100 air miles from Chattanooga, automatically shut down. It's a sign of trouble, especially because other safety features were supposed to ensure that the two pumps would never quit at the same time. Lockbaum told Free Press reporter and editor Dave Flessner, apparently, Browns Ferry operated outside the bounds of its safety study. I wonder how such a thing could happen. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's the NRC. And Monday, May 12, was not a good day in NRC because there were two separate reports that came in about nuclear reactors. One is from my old buddy, Three Mile Island near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Fuses used to protect the motor power conductors appear to be inadequate to protect the control conductors. What this engineering gobbledygook means is that under 
fire safety shutdown conditions. It is postulated, merely postulated, that a fire in one area can cause short circuits potentially resulting in secondary fires or cable fires in other areas where the cables are rooted. Mm, So much fun. Meanwhile, and this has got to be my favorite one of the week, just missed for numbnuts, at the Riverbend Nuclear Plant in Louisiana, station management determined that tritium was confirmed to be present in water samples taken from leakage underground in the turbine building. The leakage was tested for gamma and tritium activity, and no gamma contamination was detected. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Let me tell you. Tritium is a beta emitter, not a gamma emitter. So, of course, you're not going to find beta radiation coming from a gamma emitter. And yet, there it is, in black and white from the NRC. Oh, those wild and wacky guys who are running our nuclear protect people and the environment program. Over to Japan, where a manga comic strip is kicking up more attention to Fukushima than all the op-ed editorials that either are or are not running. In the April 28th issue of Shogaku Kan Weekly, the long-running and popular Oi Shinbo manga series featured a group of characters, all newspaper journalists, who visit Fukushima Daiichi and are momentarily exposed to hourly radiation levels of 1,680 microsieverts. After their tour, lead character Shiro Yamaoka begins to complain of extreme exhaustion, as well as sudden nosebleeds that span days. His colleagues confess to suffering similar symptoms. Later, when they meet a character named Katsutaka Idogawa, which is the same name as and is based on the real-life former mayor of the town of Futuba in Fukushima Prefecture, they learn that he, too, has suffered repeated nosebleed attacks and felt unbearably sick since the accident. Itagawa tells them, Many Fukushima residents have been afflicted by the same symptoms. They just don't say it openly. When contacted by the Japan Times, Shogaku Kan Weekly's managing editor said, The episode drew on meticulous reportage conducted by manja author Tetsuku Kariya and his team in Fukushima. Nothing the Itagawa character said deviated from the opinion of the real-life mayor. Kariya himself once told the media that he had suffered several bouts of nosebleeds and had been plagued by unusual fatigue following his visits to the Fukushima plant. In the latest issue, which was published this past Monday, May 12th, The former mayor of Futuba Town, which co-hosts the plant, and a university associate professor appear in the comic and confirm that the characters had nosebleeds due to radiation exposure. Story writer Kariwa has rejected criticism over the content Oishimbo and says he will fully refute the charges in a magazine in the near future. In his blog last Friday, Kariwa said people who are protesting through phone calls or emails to the publisher are mistaken. He also said that he's fully responsible for the content of the manga series. In the same blog earlier this month, Kariwa said he wrote the story based on information he had gathered in Fukushima over two years. He said he wonders if critics are suggesting that he should shut his eyes to the truth and write lies that are convenient for some people. Well, yeah, that's what they want, and good for you for not caving. In a completely cliched and expected move, Fukushima Prefecture has lodged an official complaint against Oe Shinbo, a government protesting a comic.